So uh, hopefully you guys have seen, we kind of did an intro, we shared the vision through Cornelia and hopefully Kyle shall shared some really uh, great tidbits on you know, some of these proof points in action um, about where GitOps has been today and where it's going into the future. So we're really excited that we have another speaker who um, also has some of these great proof points. And some of you might've gotten a teaser during our community days where um, it's probably one of the um, community days that we did leading up to this event where we got more than any other speaker of capital awesome in the chats, like so many questions, people are very excited. So we really, really wanted to have her back and excited. So Javeri will also be here today and tomorrow. So Javeri is a senior site engineer at Palo Alto Networks, um, but was also has given talks about GitOps um, when uh, she was at Branch. So she'll be sharing some of those stories here. So today is, um, she's got a bit of a prepared talk and we will have some time for questions and answers. So if you are streaming from YouTube, reminder um, to make sure you join our Slack channel because that's where we'll be monitoring the questions and then you'll also be able to chat with some of the speakers. Uh, and Javeri will be joining our round table tomorrow during kind of the uh, Dev Platform Day, uh, talking uh, more on the technical side about uh, what it, how the experience was to move teams and, and to uh, get them onboarded uh, with GitOps tools and such. So uh, make sure you stay tuned for that. So with that, I will hand it over to Javeria and I'll kind of join in when we're ready to take some questions toward the end. Are you good to go? Excellent. Thank you, Tamal. Hi, everyone. Let me get my slides on the screen. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming in today. So my name is Javeria Khan and today I'm going to talk about my uh, GitOps journey and how I've incorporated these practices into the infrastructure that I've worked on. Like Tamal said, I've been at a startup and then I moved over to a bigger company later. So firstly, a bit about myself. Uh, I am an electrical engineer by degree. So initially I started off my career as a hardware IC engineer, and then I switched over to software a little over six years ago. Now over these past few years in software, I've worked in multiple infrastructure uh, teams as DevOps systems and um, as the industry now likes to call it SRE. Uh, but generally, the idea is always the same. The focus is always about building infrastructure for reliability, for automation, for operability, and performance. Uh, at the moment, I am a senior SRE at Palo Alto Networks uh, in the foundational infrastructure team, as we like to call it. And I lead uh, all of our on-prem Kubernetes infra. So my team basically um, serves as a foundation layer that spans multiple organizations within our company and we build and manage uh, everything related to on-prem computational infra. Uh, and the main part of this uh, infrastructure is our Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we have about 40 of these that run on bare metal nodes across various data centers in the world. Uh, some of our newer platforms have moved on to GCP, so we have a lot of um, infrastructure being built over there as well. We do have GKE clusters um, also uh, in parallel. So uh, since I lead the building and scaling of these clusters, I also support uh, infrastructure build up. Build up. So everything uh, like that supports these environments, all the tooling in place, all the monitoring automation, and everything with a special focus on using GitOps to a developer productivity and scaling. So if anybody uh, attended any of my last sessions, <laughs> I've done a lot of them on GitOps. Uh, I tend to go into like the background of what it is and how it came about. I won't do that today because we have a, a lot of awesome speakers in this um, event and a lot of people go into those details for you. So, uh, but let me um, start by sharing what the biggest benefits of adopting GitOps have been for me in my journey. 
Uh, so since the main idea is that you're version controlling both your infrastructure code and um, you can then use a GitOps tool to compare the current state of your objects in your infra to the desired state and version control. Uh, so by automating the deployment of any kind of infra changes, uh, the first benefit you basically gain is reversibility. Uh, because rollbacks are easier, you have that previous version and source control somewhere. And um, a really good, great side effect of this is that it makes the mean time to resolving uh, config-based outages much shorter um, because you, you have track those changes and it's easy to just sort of revert commits if you want to, or you can push a new commit with the changes that you did earlier that might be breaking. Um, and then secondly, on top of this, uh, you get audit trails, which are great because now everything is going through PRs and um, there's a, sort of a log of who did what at what time. And these are also very important for maybe compliance exercises that your teams may have to do at some point as your um, company grows. And then because of these first two benefits, uh, subsequently um, our teams also gained transparency. Now this is really very important because all that special infra knowledge and control um, could, we can now disperse it within multiple people. And now there were no more obscure system changes that only a few special people knew how to do. And subsequently you became less dependent on particular employees. And in turn, those employees could also spend their vacations and even nights just in peace without getting pinged for breaking changes or for applying stuff that nobody else knew how to do. So the first three are the big ones, but generally speaking as well, um, I've been working with Kubernetes for the past, uh, over actually for over three years now. And over this time, um, I've built many uh, clusters on the cloud as well as in data centers now on bare metal nodes. And basically every time you go through that process uh, where you're designing a new cluster and you're figuring out what to put in it and all the tooling and you want, and you basically want a repeatable process that you can um, do the same way every time. Uh, also, as you're trying to incorporate other best practices uh, for security or for access control or um, uh, more automation or uh, those kinds of nice things, um, you, uh, so it doesn't matter if this is for staging or production environments, it's always the same thing. Um, staging is obviously just a subset of the way you build production, just maybe at smaller scale. But as engineers, we, um, tend to end up looking into how to optimize and automate these otherwise repetitive tasks and how managing these infrastructures that you keep building um, less painful. And I really believe uh, GitOps has helped me automate a lot of these somewhat otherwise painful tasks, uh, management tasks. And I feel um, because of it, it really brings better collaboration between all the different types of teams that eventually end up sharing these resources and people that you're building this for. So as SREs, as infra engineers, our direct customers are the other teams that use the infrastructure that we build for them. Um, they're one of the users. Obviously, you also have the customers that are using, if you're a SaaS business, that are using the infra as well. Um, so using some of these tools that I will share later and some of the examples that I've used in the past, um, I think can really help augment anybody's um, entire software development and um, development life cycles. Uh, so in my personal experience um, of adopting GitOps at two different companies over these past years, uh, first it was at a startup where our entire infrastructure was on the cloud on AWS. Um, and also because we were building everything from scratch, there was also a smaller delta that needed to be done to bring about this chain and to bring about new processes. And then later at my current role, which is now um, a larger public company with a much larger dispersed infrastructure and bigger teams. Uh, also, we have a lot of older processes in place. I find um, that when you sort of go down this path, it really helps to break down the impact by layers. Um, so as you start socializing with the different teams and the different types of people that this might affect, um, this is how you can go about sort of uh, defining uh, what the stakeholders at each layer are and um, how these tools might help their workflows and make them better, um, save them more time moving forward. So uh, I will break it down into basically two main groups, uh, the infra layer and the app layer. So beginning with firstly the foundation or the infrastructure as code layer. Uh, the main 
types of people at this layer that this kind of automation basically affects is first of all your SREs or your infra engineers or whatever um, would you like to call them in your company. Uh, these are the people that help build this stuff and they help maintain it. And then also um, there is management at this layer, um, which is concerned about how stuff at this uh, layer affects customer facing SL hits. So uh, because obviously outages and um, incidents right at infrastructure at your compute layer are stuff that's uh, very directly visible to external um, services that you might be providing on top of it. Uh, as GitOps has uh, gained more traction in the industry, uh, tools at almost every layer have realized the importance of keeping state and being able to apply that state. So as I was um, going through more research, I realized that um, we do keep talking about Kubernetes because um, this is the ecosystem that we're in at the moment. But even taking a step back uh, from that, uh, you realize that a lot of these automation tools in the DevOps space and the automation space, um, they provide some form of GitOps or the others. So I wouldn't call them complete GitOps cycle supporting tools, but they, they've got parts of it down. And if you manage to sort of, you can always pick and choose and like combine things together. So um, as I said, not all of these are completely GitOps, but they do offer parts of it and then you can sort of uh, stitch them together. So basically a few examples, this is not complete. This is just stuff that I'm more familiar with using and I've used in the past. So a few examples of how popular provisioning tools can um, be used in a GitOpsy way is, uh, first is Atlantis, which is a tool that automates Terraform apply into pull requests. Um, this is cool because it lets you standardize your provisioning Terraform workflows all within CI CD. So you would keep your Terraform scripts within um, your Git repos and then, um, Atlantis helps, uh, as soon as somebody pushes in new changes, Atlantis helps that whole cycle by doing a Terraform plan and a Terraform apply for you. So everything gets tracked within the PR, Google gets tracked there, um, the application gets tracked there. Uh, so this is sort of a nice full um, provisioning cycle that you can maintain there. And then secondly, um, there's salt. Uh, salt can be run as scheduled states that periodically run and pull source control and then apply that config. We use salt extensively within our infrastructure. It's the same concept. Uh, you can keep uh, the salt scripts and all that code within the repos. And then your schedule states, um, They for us, they run at Bootstrap and they also have scheduled times uh, depending on what group of the servers are on. And then they can pull down these things and make sure that your states are consistent with how you want them to be defined. Uh, and then coming to orchestration and config management, um, people more familiar with this whole um, layer will actually see that I've divided them into the way that I think they're more appropriate, but all of these tools, Terraform, Sol, Ansible, Puppet, Chef, um, they, they can mostly do, the, they can all do the same thing. So you can use them um, at different layers, but this is how we've preferred to break down their application. So at the orchestration config management layer, um, Ansible is classically basically a push based tool, but uh, a lot of people don't know it also supports a special pull module that can pull in and apply playbooks from Git repos. So if you sort of um, stitch together that um, pull combining module with something like a cron or a webhook, you get yourself GitOps flavored config management and you can um, sort of manage it that way as well. Uh, similarly, Puppet, a lot of people use that as well. Um, Puppet Enterprise um, has this code manager feature that automates the management and deployment of your Puppet code from repos as well. So same concept, you can keep your code somewhere and then Puppet will automatically pull and apply it for you. And very lastly, um, Flux and Argo, we will talk about, uh, you'll hear this one a lot, it's pretty popular. This, um, these tools are specifically designed for Kubernetes environments and they run as actual controllers that you can watch your config repos. So all kinds of infrastructure code, obviously your version controlling it, but I like to call um, the repos that keep infrastructure code itself, especially for Kubernetes, like the deployments and services and ingresses and load balancers and all the stuff that makes up your infrastructure, um, uh, the config that makes up your infrastructure. So I like to call them config repos. So these controllers like Flux and Argo that run inside your cluster can watch your config repos and um, also your image registries for your applications, which I will come to later, and it can apply changes to these clusters automatically. So um, that was in theory, uh, 
but how have I used it in the past? Um, so in practice, as uh, we've moved towards managing more and more hybrid infrastructure, that is both cloud and data center, we found ourselves moving towards tools and methods that support and work well in both environments and that make it easier to manage everything in centralized repositories. So it's been a trial and error in certain things, but um, also as I um, said in my introduction, my team services multiple platforms and teams and we provide the core infrastructure and tooling. Um, GitOps allows us to coordinate more smoothly across these multiple internal SRE teams and that share all of this infrastructure and config management tooling. So for Kubernetes, we've kept cluster states and version control danceable um, as a self-maintained distribution and also as local forks of upstream deployment tools such as KubeSpray, uh, also a cluster uh, deployment tool like COPS for cloud environments such as AWS, which I've used in the past. Uh, also let you keep uh, cluster states in S3, which isn't exactly code, but um, it does keep a sort of whatever state your cluster is in and how you've defined it with all the different configurations in S3 buckets. So basically all infrastructure for at the moment, all infrastructure code, uh, such as cluster components, for example, the kubelet, the CNI, etcd, uh, et cetera, as well as any add-ons for observability and extra features, uh, we keep them as Ansible templates, which are used to build and maintain and upgrade our clusters. Now, everything here goes through pull request approval processes before deployment, and it gets deployed that way, um, whether to a QA or pod environment. Uh, these Ansible playbooks were actually an internally maintained distribution uh, up until recently, and we've more recently moved uh, our new generation of clusters to use kubespray based deployments instead. I am also in the process of moving these internal Ansible based components to use Flux so that they can get updated automatically through CI without needing somebody on my team to apply these changes. Now the Kubernetes CD pipelines uh, are configured to use Vault, Helm, and uh, we have an internal fact management system to pull in secrets and server information for deployments during builds uh, outside of Kubernetes, we use GitOps to manage all of our GCP and threads of version control Terraform scripts that are applied through PRs in Atlantis pipelines. Uh, this is important because it allows our multiple SRE infra and dev teams to build up projects and internal components on demand in um, set predetermined ways, which uh, with the new approval and review process stage all handled within that same PR process and they can open PRs and they can get the components that they need with the required approvals all tracked within the same Git history. Uh, for all the on-prem stuff for provisioning, for config management, it's all done through version control salt states at scheduled states. Um, this uses a, an internal fact management system as an external node classifier with vault for secrets. Uh, the infra can then be defined as groups of hosts or applications or environments or locations or subgroups and then automation, we do this on top of it. Now coming to the second uh, application layer, uh, the people affected at this layer is basically your developers, your DevOps and test engineers. So all that local dev and testing cycles can use tools such as uh, Scaffold, for example, which is actually a quite a well-rounded tool and it can do just about everything in the dev, test and build and deploy cycles. So you can use it at any stage of your pipeline. Um, and then uh, these are just a few of them. There are many more tools available, but these are just a few of the popular ones. So draft by Azure is uh, good for the inner dev workflows and testing changes on Kubernetes sandboxes. It's basically a tool for developing apps. So it's meant to be used before code is committed to source control uh, as it's purely intended to be used for very quick development workflows when writing applications for Kubernetes. Uh, and then lastly, we have Gitcube. Uh, this one runs as a controller in the cluster and it also lets you use simple Git push from your local environment to automate everything from build to deploy to test. Uh, so whenever any change in code is made, um, committing and pushing it will sort of uh, trigger uh, a build and rollout just from Git. Now coming to the second um, deployment stage, uh, along with templating, uh, Templating tools such as Helm and Customize help define your apps and they make it easier to roll out different versions for different clusters. Now these tools, uh, these templating tools can be used in combination with deployment tools such as Flux and Argo um, and Flagger and also Scaffold above uh, to roll out these cluster applications. Um, 
and these are the ones that are meant to be used. These later tools are the ones to, that are meant to be used in production to help keep things in sync with source control. So while Flux and Argo are uh, deployment tools, they, they're actually pulling in changes from Docker registries or from config repos. Flagger is cool because uh, when I was starting to use GitOps, there was actually no direct support for doing automatic rollbacks uh, dependent, uh, depending on metrics that you were perhaps watching for your endpoints. Flagger lets you do those advanced uh, deployment models such as blue greens and canaries. So when you're rolling out something in production, you can do gradual rollouts and you can do gradual deployments. Uh, but in practice, uh, I've used flux at the end of deployment pipelines to basically update YAML definitions and config repos rather than having the CI edit clusters directly. Um, flux can also be used to just watch your images directly in your image registry, but I preferred not to do that because uh, I just found that doing rollbacks became uh, otherwise non-straightforward because you had to go de-automate the deployment and then roll back and then automate it again when you wanted it to be watched. So uh, hooking that part up with something like Flagger instead made much more sense where the rollout happened within the CI CD. And um, this also really helps improve your security practices, obviously, because the CI system now doesn't need to be given access to your cluster. And you don't necessarily have to run the CI inside your cluster either. Obviously, you would do that for um, as you were growing or for load balancing purposes. but this becomes more complex as you create more and more clusters over time and that single CI system now has uh, multiple destination targets where it needs to deploy to. And this also really makes a difference when you go from um, single clusters to multiple ones and you have the same deployments in uh, multiple locations that need to be kept in sync. Uh, this is where the load balancing part comes in where you have, for example, maybe DR regions or just uh, for edge purposes, you're servicing the same, uh, they're providing the same application in multiple regions. Um, and especially with the odd issues where one deployment can go out of sync with the rest because somebody accidentally modified the uh, image or maybe the resources that it was using. And they were perhaps testing something, but they forgot to revert back. Or the odd time where um, somebody accidentally points a production um, image to a staging one instead. So these types of things, um, once we introduced Flux, uh, the CI pipelines were simply changed to update the image in another repo that kept cluster deployment YAMLs. And these later config repos were the ones that Flux was hooked up to and that it watched. Uh, also outside of Kubernetes, we have a few things that ha we've had homegrown solutions for, uh, which I would also like to categorize as GitOps. So a really good example here is uh, Prometheus config changes. Uh, which we keep in a repo. And then client sync agents that you can then run on global Prometheus servers, um, they watch that config repo for Prometheus alert manager roles. And as soon as they see changes, they pull them in. And then um, prom tool it use, is used on the destination servers on top of these changes to validate them and then apply them as needed. Now, this here um, is actually a really good example of uh, improving collaboration uh, as we scaled and more teams were given their own dedicated clusters or their own dedicated namespaces and they had their own alert streams. And uh, for example, if they, um, if another team has this noisy alert going off at 2 a.m., um, they can just uh, go update their alerts in the repo themselves and merge the changes and they don't necessarily need to wait for an admin to do it for them. So lastly, um, I've already talked about all the tools. Uh, how do you get teams on board? I have experience of doing this twice. Uh, like I mentioned at a smarter, more, uh, a smaller, more agile company now at a bigger one with process that, processes that were already in place. Uh, I feel personally that collaboration between dev and ops teams is actually really very important for a successful GitOps culture. Uh, I've learned that the biggest challenge in introducing any kind of new processes is in convincing people to take out time to learn and adapt to it. So even when it's meant to eventually optimize their daily workflows, it can be hard to convince other teams to um, take out the initial time to learn and also to change their workflows. And um, I guess as operators, we can just try and keep the delta at their end as minimal as possible. Uh, and I, I guess the ideal here is obviously push button operations, but um, that's, that's a goal that's not easily attainable. Uh, also really socializing new designs and processes can help. So um, that way you can incorporate user feedback early on. Um, 
if I take the flux example, for example, we basically just had to socialize the idea that people weren't supposed to edit things directly in the clusters anymore. And that um, any changes they did would get reverted back by the sync controllers in another minute or so. Uh, and that they were actually supposed to go and create pull requests for config uh, in the config repos that kept keep these manifests. Uh, and then secondly, the other really big uh, I advantage, uh, I would say, or attractive point for people is uh, convincing them is by socializing how their dependency on admins will decrease. So with GitOps uh, tools, the changes in infra can roll out and they can roll back through Git merges. That's automatic. Uh, and that way you don't necessarily need to go ping that main admin on vacation, which is usually the case in startups, um, to roll out special changes or to roll back a broken build. And uh, in extension, uh, a main attraction for the management layer folks is that as you cycle through employees, uh, you sort of reduce the dependency on single employees with all that special infra knowledge and which we sort of also informally refer to as the bus factor. So this is it for the presentation. I see I'm just right about on time. I suppose we don't have that much time for QA, but I am hanging out in the Slack GitOps Day channel um, for more questions and comments if anybody has them. Yeah, saying you're like, oh, I've got a really short presentation and you took up the whole time, which is great. It's fantastic. Yeah, so we are at time. I will just throw in, if you can answer just super quickly. Yeah, like on a high level, like how was the championing process? So I think it really depends on um, where you are as a team and as a company and startups is easier because um, things are more faster, the processes are more faster. But I think in both places, what I've learned is the biggest, uh, uh, e the best way to do this is by really socializing. You you definitely can't um, over communicate at this layer because you're rolling out stuff that will um, uh, affect people's day-to-day -day work. So. Um, just scheduling meetings and um, making sure people are aware of how this changes their workflows, but how it improves them, um, how spending like half an hour every day to learn these new tools and really help them in the long term and help make their processes better. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, so to remind everybody, Javeri will be here tomorrow as part of our roundtable, so we'll have more time to go through that as well. And we have had questions uh, in the Slack channel, so will you be able to join afterwards? Because in fact, um, so as I was kind of breaking out, today is a little bit more um, high level, you know, how do we do these talking points um, like with leadership and, and peers and such, and um, the questions are actually fairly more technical and, and then it's 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 sparked like all these great discussions. So um, Javeri will join you guys in a bit. So yeah, if any of you watching on YouTube, you have questions in the Slack channel, uh, please feel free to join there and uh, she'll be there and uh, answer some of your questions. So thanks so much Javeri.